Hi, it's Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop, and we have Ian from Kitchener, Ontario. Ontario. And uh, he's an MGA fan, and he actually uh, signed up for my class, I think, about a year ago. But because of COVID and stuff, he uh, didn't get to come down until like last week, and he did the 13-day uh, deal. So he's been here for 13 10-hour days, and he's actually survived the 13 10-hour days. <laughs> So he has, he has an English wheel at home, and he's pushed the metal through it a couple times, and uh, he hasn't really uh, understood what he was doing, so that's why he wanted to take my class. And he's got four of these MGAs. What year are they, Ian? They're 1959. 59s, and Ian can talk a little bit about his car here. It's an MGA, and it's a special one. It's the MGA twin cam. There was only 2,100 or so made. I have four of them in various states, and so I needed some replacement fenders. And Ray is definitely the guy to come and see the Pro Shaper to, to figure out how to make those. And you also want to, the hoods and the doors and the deck lid are all aluminum on <clears throat> all the cars. That's correct. I have one car, though, where the body's not worth repairing, and I want to do an aluminum body. And uh, I wanted to see if I could come and work with Ray to see if I had enough skills to actually make an entire car body. And after the course, I feel like I can do that. Yeah, so as you can see, these fenders, the MGA fenders, they're fully curvy fenders. There's nothing that they uh, held back as far as the design goes. There's a lot of uh, really uh, intense curves, a lot of flanges and everything else on them. So they're not by any stretch a simple piece to make. So Ian started from zero pretty much as far as shaping the metal goes and he came down and he'd seen a lot of my videos and he knew what the flexible shape pattern could do. So I made, had him make this uh, flexible shape pattern and you see how that was made right off of this fender here. And we made it in two pieces and we put the parting seam right here. So that means this part was not that hard to do this is uh, pretty much a flat panel here, but it has all these, it's got a double joggle here, which is a, a, a single joggle rather, which is a tough one to do. And it's got flanges, a bunch of spots on this side here and then down on the bottom. And uh, I, I chose to do it here, which was actually added a level of complexity. If we had put the seam over here, it would have been maybe a little bit easier. But uh, Ian was up for the task. And here's the panel he made. This is actually the first panel of any substance that he has made. And uh, he just did a superb job on it. Not only uh, shaping all the metal, but all the detail work, the flanges and everything. Um, and, and now the proof is in the pudding. So the flexible shape pattern fits this. And now let's see how it fits Ian's piece. Look at that. Absolutely perfect. So what this tells you is the flexible shape pattern does not lie. It gives you both the area value and uh, with the gauges, you get the arrangement value also. And Ian made a stack of gauges. They're over on the other bench over there. And you have to get all of these curves going in the right way with the, uh, the, the, the profile gauges. And he did that perfectly. The only flaw that I could see, and I, I'm a master of looking for flaws and finding flaws, is right here, he missed it a little bit. It's about an eighth of an inch off right here. But this is just like a lower appendage. It'd be like a, a tail being a little bit longer right there. Nobody will ever see it. He could easily correct it if he was crazy enough to do it, but uh, he'll probably leave that. So I tacked it up. He didn't trust his welding skills yet. He's gonna go home and practice for a week or so of uh, practicing his TIG welding and uh, then he'll feel confident in doing the TIG welding. He did all the grinding, I tacked it up. He did all the grinding, I showed him how to grind it properly. And what has to happen now is we need to weld this seam all the way. And we can start over here and weld the entire seam. There'll be a little bit of heat distortion, but it'll be a very easy cleanup. You always put your seams away from something that can be bugged up. And we don't want to bug up this uh, nice line right here. So 
the planishing uh, hammer dies are an inch and a half wide and that gives us ample room here so we don't catch this edge. We would have done the same thing over here. This would have been a one inch offset over here where we would have put the seam if we decided to put the seam here. So just an outstanding job. Looks beautiful and the flexible shape pattern verifies that it's 100% correct. He did uh, as good as you possibly can do. So what needs to happen now is with the tack up, there's a little bit of uh, uh, height difference. So you always want to get your, 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 your heights right when you tack up, but sometimes you'll get a little bit off. So one side could be a little higher than the other. So we'll put this in the planishing hammer and then we're going to weld this solid. All right, we got the planishing hammer ready. We got a, a bottom die with just a little bit of uh, curvature to it here, a little crown to it. We got a small flat die on the top. When you planish and hammer, this is where I use the planish and hammer most, is just to, to uh, crush the wells and level it. So you want to make sure you're horizontal. The big, there's two no-nos when using a planish and hammer. One, you have to have it horizontal, exactly like an English wheel. And people have always asked me on my English wheel, why are my wheels so wide? Because it holds it on horizontal. When you go on horizontal, you get into nasty problems. What will happen is the edge of the, the dies will dig in on the English wheel. It's the edge of the top wheel or the bottom wheel that will dig in. So we got to set this so we got a nice light hit. We've got a regulator valve there, we lowered it a little bit. We'll start in the middle where it's nice and balanced and we'll pull it over. We have very little distortion from the tacks. We'll get a little distortion from the actual weld. So the two problems with the planishing hammer is if you go off a horizontal, that's one of the problems. The other problem is you want to really push down hard on that bottom die because what happens, same thing happens with a body hammer. If you have a dolly underneath and you start hitting it with the, with the hammer, what you do is you take a convex surface and you just start to pound it in. Uh, and, and you can do that with the, a body hammer, you can do it with this. So you've got to make sure that you, you don't allow that to happen. You want all the action to be happening right on that little contact area. And, and uh, again, if you're not on the horizontal, you're not on that contact area, and you're going to cause a problem. So this is a little tricky because you've got to make sure you're totally horizontal, right in the center of the weld, and you've got to be the, in the center of the bead. So a little leveling like that with the hammer will smooth this out and make sure that that's all on the same uh, surface here, that we don't have one, one side higher than the other. And then we did that little three or four inch section, now we'll do another little three or four inch section. That looks good. And I don't know if I got time to do the other sections, but what we're going to do is we'll weld a little section of this to show you what it looks like all welded up. All right, we're just going to weld this little section right here. And there's a little bit of gap in here, so I don't have copper in it. I could put copper in it, but it'll be okay. And I'm using a 1 16th rod. Technically, uh, I, normally I would use, uh, if it was the joint was very tight, I'd use my 030 rod. But uh, we're going to be a little proud both on the top side and the bottom side when we're done. And we're using the Harbor Freight uh, Vulcan welder, which I love. It's a great little welder. And the original um, cord that came with the Harbor Freight welder, uh, the torch cord, was a heavy rubber and it was, it was very heavy and uh, wasn't that pliable and stuff. So we were able to get uh, CK Worldwide a nice new torch and that made a big difference here. So here we go, we're going to weld this up and I'm going to do uh, pulsing. There, the machine does have a pulse function, but I, I've been, lately I've been adopting the, again the pulse with my foot. 
I go through cycles. Sometimes I, I use the pulse on the welder. Sometimes I use the pulse on the foot. Right now I'm in the pulse foot cycle of my welding game. All right, so that's a little inch and a half, a uh, little test. Sorry guys, I got half his glove in my shot. So here's the bead, that's what you want. You see how I'm pretty consistent on the heat affected zone. You don't want to see uh, the heat affected zone jumping all over the place. Uh, under an inch on a heat affected zone is a good thing. I'm using 1 16th rod. Uh, technically I'm going to have a little wider heat affected zone because I had the 1 16th rod. And then on the back side, there's the, a positive there. You've got material that you can grind and this weld will totally disappear. There's absolutely no comparison between the results that you can get with a TIG versus a MIG. The MIG is, uh, you can actually do a pretty good job and there's people that are pro very proficient at MIGs. A lot of uh, uh, hobbyists will choose a MIG over a TIG because technically, uh, well, before it used to be the MIG was very inexpensive relative to the TIG. But TIGs are, are very affordable today. You got a wide range of, of TIG welding machines you can buy that will do a really superb job. I, I got that little Chinese one. This is Chinese too, but I got $300 weld. You could probably get a $200 weld that it will do a really good job on steel. And uh, this is as good as it gets as far as welding. Uh, technically, if I uh, fusion welded it, it would probably look a little bit better, but there'd be divots. When you add rod, uh, generally you're not going to have any little divots that you have to go in later and fill. So, uh, we can bring Ian in again. Ian, this is what you want to do <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when, you get, when you get back to Canada, you want to get your welds oh, all boy. like that. I'll try. And. Um, we got to practice a little bit on the aluminum welding too because he wants to do the aluminum uh, fender. And I just can't be more happy with uh, what uh, Ian did as far as the results on this fender. And just about any student that comes to my class, follow my directions and that's what Ian did right to the T. I mean all these difficult joggles that he put in and everything, that's a lot of bending and uh, tipping and shrinking and stretching and hammering and dialing. It, uh, it takes a lot of time to get all these details right the way you want them. And uh, he, he was up for the task and he did a superb job. And it's fun, my job of teaching is fun when the students yield results like this. This is an amazing result. So thanks for coming in and uh, glad you're in the video too. Thanks, Rick. And please remember to subscribe. Give us the likes, hit that little notification uh, bell, and also give us some comments. But remember that metal is clay. Anybody can do this work with a little bit of patience and good instruction or following uh, my videos really closely too. Thanks for watching. It's Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop in Charlton, Massachusetts.